I can't tell you how excited I am to be here because I often speak to people that are sometimes faculty and staff, and as the years go on, they look like my kids. And then the students are like grandkids. And so I just want to say that I'm so excited to be with my peeps. And that it, doesn't it like seem like two years ago when we were saying don't trust anybody over 30? Anybody remember that? We have met the enemy and they are us. So what I want to talk about today, and I'm going to be going really quickly, these slides will be available, and I'm not going to get it all into the research part of it, but they will be available to you if you're kind of nerdy and you're going like, well, so what is she saying this for? You'll find out. There's all research behind it. So let's launch, and just if I'm going too fast, go, hmm. All right. First myth about happiness that I want to spend a moment debunking is people say, well, isn't happiness self-serving? Isn't it selfish? Why do I worry about my own happiness when the world is falling apart? That is exactly why you should be thinking about your own happiness. This world needs you and you and you to show up and contribute your gifts. And when our cup is drained, and all of the negativity, the despair at our stage of life, loss and grief, it's hard to give. So it's important to keep our cup filled to the greatest extent possible so that we can reach out and help heal this world because this world needs us. It truly needs us. Are you all with me on that? It's so important. And believe me, these kids that look like they got it all going on, these kids at Stanford, the suffering is amazing. I mean, I could spend 30 minutes just telling you about that, how much these kids are in pain. Graduate students, undergraduate students, the helicopter parenting, the social media, the constant striving and competition is really wearing down our students' mental health and their well-being. So let's show them the way. We know some things they haven't gotten at. So I'm going to ask you to contribute to this conversation with this question. I'd like to go like this and have a brave person, the person wearing the most colorful shirt at the table. Raise your hand. to tell, answer this question. And I want to hear answers that are the most highly elevated to the most short-term pleasure. So let's start with you, because you've got on a great shirt. Oh my gosh. So uh, the, the most elevated? Um, Either what, way. Uh, what makes me happy? I think what makes me happy is to see other people happy, to see other people healthy and and satisfied and Beautiful. really doing well. Seeing other people happy. How about this table? One word, even one word. Laughing. Laughing. This table. My bloodhound. What was that? Her bloodhound. Her bloodhound. Your, oh, pets. How many have pets that make you happy? How many people get happy when they see other people happy? Oh, you're in a compassionate group. Okay, quick, quick. Yeah. Feeling love and support from other people. Receiving and giving support to other people. Two things. <laughs> My grandson's baseball. Oh, grandson's baseball. And the stock baseball. market. And soccer? And stock market. Stock market. Good luck. <laughs> Just a few more because our time is so short. Music. Thank both, you. Both music. singing and listening to beautiful music. Listening to beautiful music. Beautiful. A great glass of wine. All right. We could stop right there. All right. Like, let's give a shout out 
just because of time, if somebody wants to call something out because, like, you can't stand holding it in, what is it? Chocolate. Chocolate. All right. Just shout. Great books. Singing. May I use my name, Juanita Nisley, instead of Missley? Juanita. Juanita is the name of my best friend. Okay, what makes us happy? Here's an insight into all of the research that says this is what the happiest people do, the kinds of lives they have. Number one, taking a look, these are sort of capturing some of the things that make you happy, right? So what does this say? Looking at this composition of milk and cookies and the Rolling Stones and babies and tea and beautiful beauty and... The first way that people have happy lives is they are completely filled with pleasure. Pleasure. How many of you have these long, endless to-do lists you wake up in the morning and like you're stressed out before your butt is even out of bed because you know you're not going to get to your to-do list. So you're still in bed and you're awake and you've got cortisol, as Georgina mentioned, flooding through you. And already you're like a total stressed out case, right? So pleasure, waking up, building into your day, scheduling in early in the day, what gives me pleasure? And that becomes the foundation for these other things. The second kind of life is an engaged life. You mentioned following the stock market. You mentioned listening to music. You mentioned connecting with the things that you, you know, there's a word for this called flow. Flow means that you lose yourself, the inner chatter, blah, 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 and you are in the moment. You're in the moment without self-consciousness and without a sense of time. Those experiences where you have to go, how much time just passed? Wow. The happiest people filter through their day and identify the things that gauges them. Now, had the... Um, Pleasures are short-term, right? It's not enough and it's not sustainable. People who spend their entire life, especially retiring, oh, what are you going to do? Oh, I'm going to go to brunch. I'm going to go out to lunch. I'm like going to do this. How many of you know somebody who said that and then they're bored? Right? The reason is short-term gratification doesn't stick very long. It's called the hedonic treadmill. We get really used to it, and then we want more and more and more. But these kinds of things are endless. They provide us with a sense of endless fulfillment, this sense of flow and being engaged with activities. So don't do the stuff that bores you. Many of you are retired. You're done with that. Find what captures your curiosity, your intellect, your desire to strive and achieve, those are the things that are beautiful. And the second kind of eudonic happiness, oh, I forgot, just as a personal thing. Talk about flow. Talk about flow, right? I mean, flow doesn't always feel good. When you're in the middle of tackling something new, it doesn't always feel good. There's a lot of frustration. There's a lot of stress. Even watching it makes me feel like I need a Valium. But the reward comes at the end. It's not immediate. And it requires a tolerance, a tolerance for being frustrated. Because until we get really good at something, the road is not so easy. This third life is the meaningful life. And many of you touched on this. Finding the gifts in your life, finding the gifts in your own character. And I love this quote, the meaning of life is to find your gift. The purpose of your life is to give it away. 
So here's where we come to, this all sounds so wonderful, but how? What's the how-to? How do you do this? And this is where grit, gumption, and grace come in. I'm going to echo what Georgina said. We are crazed on the peninsula. We are, our nervous systems are not designed for this kind of traffic, this kind of pace, these kinds of choices, and we run around like chickens with our heads cut off. So, peace is a breath away. Those three deep breaths are so important. If you have a meditation practice, you don't need to spend three hours sitting like a monk in a cave. But it's a time out to connect and come home to yourself. In the midst of going from one activity to another, to take that deep breath that brings you into a sense of peace and balance and gather yourself inward. We're so focused out there and our nervous systems require us to come back. So I urge you to consider finding prayer, observing beauty, quieting your nervous system. And here's why. You cannot experience positive emotions unless you're calm. It's just impossible. You can't walk into a party as a complete stress case and enjoy yourself unless, and that's why we do it, right? Oh, I'm too stressed, I want to relax like I need three drinks. So another option is, hey, have the drinks. I'm not like, calm yourself down first. Deep breaths. Then we can begin the practice of gratitude. There has been Everything I'm going to tell you has a lot of research behind it. We're going to go real fast through those slides. The research is showing that living with a grateful heart has power and energy to heal almost anything. Here are the research indicators. All of the research shows that people who are grateful enjoy better psychological and mental health, are physically healthier, and have better social lives. This is pretty powerful stuff. So something for you to think about now is in what ways are you grateful? How do you experience gratitude and express it? So I'm going to ask you just for a minute to engage in a little activity. So you can take a break from listening. So I'm going to invite everybody to just sit and you can either close your eyes Nothing scary is going to happen. Or if, if you don't like doing that, just keep your eyes softly gazing at something in front of you. And please with me. Okay. Miss. Yeah, and be grateful for that. Juanita's on it. Okay. She's. So please close your eyes or gaze. And I'd like you to take three nice deep breaths, getting oxygen to your brain. Just three deep breaths. And let's... Fire up our imagination. I'd like everybody to think of someone who has made an incredible positive difference in your life. Someone two-legged, four-legged, someone. And really in your imagination, take this moment to picture them in your mind's eye, as if they were here. And notice their face and the features in their face. What does their eyes look like when they meet yours? What do you feel when you respond to them? And in your mind's eye, express for a moment gratitude. And in your sort of sub-vocal way, say, I maybe never told you this before. I am so grateful to you. 
thank you. You have contributed so much to my life. And live in this moment. Be in this moment. This is the moment of gratitude. The studies show that this deliberate practice is available to you always. But first, you need to breathe so you could get calm enough to experience this positive emotion, especially living here. So a good way to come back to the room if you're kind of floating in this is just wiggle a little bit your fingers. And if we had more time, here's what I would tell you to do. And you've got a homework assignment. I'm in faculty at Stanford. How could I let you leave this room without a homework assignment? When you get home, think of someone who you have this feeling toward that has a cell phone and send them what we call a grata text, a short text. Honey, dude, brother, sister, you know, I was just thinking about you today and I just want to tell you how much I appreciate you for, and be specific, for what? You will find doing this once a day will change your life. If you really want to ramp up the goodness in your life, do this every day. Send an email. Call somebody. Send them a letter. It's fabulous, life-changing stuff. And when you have a good lifestyle, like Georgina was talking about, it's amazing. If you worry about depression or anxiety, the things that many of us at this stage of life worry about, this is the antidote. Gratitude is the antidote. However, we all have difficult times. At this stage of life, the grief, the loss, the sort of cultural way we're sort of seen as, oh, they're old. You know, we're patronized or we're pat on the head or we're overlooked. You know what I'm talking about, right? These are things that are harder for us at this stage of life, and we need to be resilient. And the word gumption is my word for courage. I grew up on the East Coast. Like, would you get yourself some gumption? Like, grow a pair, whatever we say here. Um, and I want to tell you a story about gumption as the kind of courage to say, I may be facing difficulty, frustration, disappointment, grief, loss. I will let all these things, there's a part of me that feels this way. We don't want to smash or have violence toward that part. And sometimes that part needs time to express itself. But that's just one part of us. We have a huge bandwidth available to switch our attention when the time is right, and that's important, we need time to grieve. But then there's that tipping point. What else is available to me? So I wanna use my grandmas as an example. Both of my grandmas lost unbelievable numbers of family members in the Holocaust. Both of them escaped and came to this country. Um, my grandma, and this captures my grandma's temperaments. So who do you see in these pictures? Yeah? I had one grandma who, looking back, my bubby was clinically depressed. I would say today we would be seeking treatment. We didn't know better. Her experiences damaged her. And she identified with those experiences, with little tiny openings for family. And her goodness came from serving family. That was her meaning. My other grandma was totally different, and living life well was her best revenge. Two different temperaments and two different approaches to being happy. I loved them both dearly, but here's the thing. One grandma forgave, doesn't mean making it okay. The other grandma let it go 
to live her good life. And this role of forgiveness in terms of being resilient and strong is like when we hold on to bitterness and we hold on to resentment and there's no more we can do about it. It's like we hold bitterness and anger and it's like us swallowing poison and expecting the other person to get sick. That's what happens. It is destroying our own capacity for well-being when we hold this resentment. So all of us have these little places in our lives where we're like, oh, God, I just I can't let it go. That's okay, but don't over-identify with it. Or look for ways. This isn't about the other person. It's about you. Now, ethical justice is another story. I'm not talking about that. But how many of you, I, I had family members, I'm sure you do too, it's like, no, you can't invite that part of the family to Thanksgiving, I'm not going to show up. And as a kid, I'd be like, really, what happened? I don't remember, but just don't invite them to show up. The destruction and the little micro-violences that come out of that, yes, they damage the family, they damage the next generation, and they hurt us. So I want to talk about mindset. Carol Dweck at Stanford talks. Mindset is essentially what's the lens that you look at life as? And here's the aging is a bummer. Aging is a bummer. It's driven by resisting aging and really identifying with all the negativity. Aging involves people who limit themselves, limit their ideas by feeling they're deprived of something, focusing too much on, remember when I was so physically active and strong. And it's reactive. It's like looking back at life with fault finding about what's happening now. So what do you think the opposite of this might be? Change your mindset. Aging can be a gift. Now, I'm not like a rose-colored glasses person. You never are when you have family that suffered unbelievable trauma. However, I know that this is a deep truth. We will be miserable if we think of aging only as something negative. There's that part of me. Hi, aging is a bummer. It's there. It's real. But what else is possible? What other parts of me can I bring out and celebrate? There's a lot. We are seniors. I have a friend who says, she's wild. She is like a sexy girl. And she goes, I'm living like an ecstatic elder. Well, that's great. Other people see themselves as the wisdom bearers. Other people see themselves as the ones who could love our grandkids in a very different way than their parents do. These are beautiful gifts about aging. We're motivated by giving back. All of us have been the benefactors of many blessings. Now, we're not so much involved in striving and competition and how am I doing on the corporate ladder. It's now our time to give back. And instead of looking back at memories with this, oh, God, I once was and now I'm not, pump up the joy of those memories. Just remember, they were fabulous. And this is the life that you had. This is your blessing. And then moving to the future. Seek vision, positive values, and resilience. So this is about how you hold the past do you hold it with pumped up great memories and fun and even the grief part, remembering the gifts that people left us with? In the present, are you kind of sunk down with kind of depressing feelings or are you looking at the now as another opportunity for joy, for giving back, and then in the future, what visions do you have? Don't stop setting goals. Don't stop shooting for the stars. Don't stop any of that. Ramp it up and make it bigger. Travel, stock market, puppies, babies, 
partners, bridge, chess, it's all fabulous. Here's why we need resilience. Really? Really? I'm really going to need to deal with all this stuff. I really am going to need to deal with Social Security. Are you kidding? I'm really going to need to that I hardly can run anymore because I get bursitis. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. This is it. But here's a great quote from a rabbi, Hillel Goldberg. I have a lot. I love this. I get up. I fall down. Meanwhile, I keep dancing. And think about a time, and when you get these PowerPoints, really think about a time when you were resilient. When did you practice this great mindset? When did you practice the mindset that's a growth opportunity mindset? Consider a time where you were struggling, loss of a loved one, or an illness, or your own illness. And think about aging as a gift, and that it can restore and really ramp up your sense of well-being. Grace. The contentment of close, warm connections. There are 100,000 research studies looking at the role of social support in our lives. For us at our life stage, this is the gold standard of well-being. This sense of feeling cared for and caring for both ways, the sense of being so, having a soft heart toward the people that are around us, the sense of being a leader for other people, the generations leading and giving and caring and connecting. The, it's a, it's a, a, a huge research study here um, from Harvard. There were, I think, over 300,000 people. And this is just the bottom line. Strong relationships give us pleasure and health. They induce long-term health as powerfully as adequate sleep, a good diet, exercise, and not smoking. That's the power of connection. And on the other side, loneliness. Loneliness leads to, this was astonishing, premature death. People who live their life feeling lonely have a higher mortality rate than people who smoke 15 cigarettes a day. Is that like not astonishing? It's astonishing. Now, please don't misunderstand me. There are introverts in this room, and you feel great pleasure in, in solitude. You feel great pleasure in quiet moments. That's different than loneliness. Loneliness is when you feel, I am alone, I have no support, nobody sees me, nobody hears me. We all want to be seen and heard. Uh, the amazing Maya Angelou has this great quote, I've learned that people will forget what you said, they'll forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. And when you spend your life making other people feel valued, this is your recipe for deep happiness. We have to accept our imperfections with compassion. I could just see from how you answered, this is a group, I'm going to guess, compassion for other people comes pretty easy to you, you think? Empathy, helping, same energy toward ourselves. And to understand that we are imperfect, we are flawed, we will always be. This is never going to change. And the Japanese recognize this in this beautiful concept called wabi-sabi. And when they have a piece of pottery and it cracks, it is revered. Because its imperfect nature is what's celebrated by filling it with gold. And I think this message is so important for us to give up the sense that we need to be a certain way and to start being kind and encouraging to the person that we actually are. So, to summarize, how do you flourish in this wild and precious life? And particularly at this stage of life, summary, quiet mind and clear thinking, 
gratitude, finding benefit. I want to stop here for a sec. There's a phenomenon called a negativity bias. We have inherited really faulty wiring from our ancestors. The most primal part of our brain for our own survival is designed to find fault. I mean, some of you may be sitting here going, I don't like her jacket, I don't like how she talks. Or you're th I'm talking and you're thinking about that idiot that cut you off on the road, or your whoever, supervisor, your cranky daughter. This is the way the brain works for our survival. It's scanning for potential threat and menace. The problem is that makes us happy or miserable. How many of you know somebody who's miserable and always focusing on what's negative? The person we pray, oh my God, please don't have her come to Thanksgiving. That person, right? The best way, we all have the negativity bias. It's in all of us. I mean, I could sit here and tell you 4,000 things that are wrong in this moment. In this moment. The challenge is accepting that's a part of me. That's how it goes. But I'm not over-identifying with it. I have other, keep saying this, other options that are more life-giving, more enhancing. Gratitude is finding benefit in the moment. Gumption is having courage and resilience to accept and deal with those things we can't change, a little bit like the Desiderata. And grace is having those connections that research tells us is the gold standard of living the good life. Whether it means you have one person, your go-to person, you guys are called the introverts, or the extroverts, you have tribes of people. It's you feeling, I am seen, I am heard, I am loved. Back to the word love. So, I'd like to do, where are we with time? Are we good? I mentioned this because I thought we were gonna run out of time, but I'm gonna spend a moment on this slide. We do truly make a difference. Each one of us in our own communities can really be positive change makers. In our families, we can help our younger people see how over-identified they are with all the problems. Great advice. Is this a small problem? Is this a medium problem? Is this a huge problem? Making those distinctions in our culture, and certainly with young people, every little obstacle along the road becomes a crisis and a trauma, and they need therapy, and they need to step out of school because they're frustrated. That's a small problem. Let's keep it in perspective. We are the wisdom bearers to help our daughters, sons, and grandchildren understand that. That's just one way you can make a difference. Teaching people the skills that you have. Bringing kids in, learning if you, whatever your hobbies are, chess, sewing, um, painting. Give it back, give it back. So. The three keys in the life arc, this is, as Mary Oliver says, a wild and precious life that we've been given. What are we gonna do with it? What will you do with your one wild and precious life? So looking back at the many years that we've already spent, relish the memories with gratitude. Being in the moment, be kind, be forgiving, and have resilience for loss and suffering but be present. This is our moment. And obsessing about the past or getting involved in catastrophic, how many of you think you're like your catastrophic thinkers, like you look at the future and it's like all you can think of are all the like, oh my God, what if that happens? What if that happens? What if that happens? Some of you, yeah. It's, all these things have a certain benefit. Of course you wanna be smart. Of course you want to be strategic about the decisions you make. But having that be your North Star does not lead to happiness. Having a big, fat, juicy vision and going for it, little tiny step at a time, 
that's where you find that sweet spot into happiness. And finally, looking forward of bringing our kindest, our most generous, our most compassionate self forward and nurturing that part of us, that self in there, is the thing that leads to amazing happiness. So um, would you like to do another practice, just a brief practice? This is a very powerful practice often done in the East, and it's called metta, and we translate it to loving kindness. This is something you don't need to be suffering for. You can be happy and do it. And it's a way of taking the very sense of vision and bringing joy to yourself. So if you would, again, if you're an eyes closed, comfy person, then please do that. It's better. Um, or I shouldn't say better. It's preferable for your experience. But if that makes you uncomfortable, just don't look at me. Look at something neutral. And don't look at another person, actually. Just look at something neutral. And again, coming present, deep, arriving into yourself, gathering yourself in. Take a few breaths. I'm a scuba diver, so I love deep breathing. I think it's awesome because you get oxygen hits in your brain. And think to yourself in your mind's eye quietly, may I be happy. May I be safe. May I live with ease. And bring to mind someone that is a beloved, a friend, a family member, a pet, and imagine them, maybe the person that you express gratitude for, and think to them, may you be happy. May you be safe. May you live with ease. And please picture the two of you together in some space that is a place you love being in. And just let that come to your imagination and think, may we be happy. May we, may we be safe. May we both live with ease. And now, to create neural connections in your brain, whisper to yourself, may we be happy, you and your special person or pet. May we be happy. May we be safe. May we live with ease. Let's do one more go around and whisper quietly, really quietly, but whisper. Have that little vocalization, and I'll tell you why later. May we be happy. I love seeing those lips moving. May we be safe. May we live with ease. And finally, consider bringing in a person in your life who is struggling, suffering, in pain, illness, injury, loss, and bring them into this community with you and your special person. And the three of you together, or whoever else joins you, particularly sending to this person in need, may we all be happy. 
May we all be happy. May we all be healthy. May we all be healthy. May we all live with ease. May we all live with ease. And just listen for a moment. Some of you are feeling, having a deep experience. There are some tears. Tears are a sign of strength. There's the body expressing the incredible amazement and fear of this cycle of life. Often, we feel helpless. We want to fix things. And when somebody is ill, there's that feeling of helplessness. I can't fix this, and I want to. We want to feel in control, and we can't. But this practice, this is how we can do it. This is how we can do it. We can say it to ourselves. We can hold their hand. And we can say, may you be happy, may you be safe, may you live with ease. We all feel a sense of well-being. So our time is so short today. Please kind of come back to the room in your own way, however it feels right for you. Just, I just two more slides. On your um, slides, you'll see that if this kind of work interests you, there are amazing resources out there where you can really dig in. You can really learn. Um, I love all of these resources. They're my go-to places. Finally, if you're resonating with this work and you would like a day in a wonderful group of people, um, I'm teaching a continuing studies course. I've been doing it for years at Stanford. It's a one-day course that, that has the same theme, but we go much deeper and there's more interaction and a lot of conversation about how does this relate to people's lives and, and more digging into the research. Finally, I really thank you for your kind attention. And I guess we can take some questions. Thank you. Thanks so much.